Welcome to the Relationship Help Show. Your time with Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. Through the magic of the Internet, Dr. Shaler provides urgent and ongoing care for relationships in crisis to people throughout the world, and she's here for you now. Whether you are experiencing a momentary blow-up or the crazy making of life with a partner, ex, child, or parent who is relentlessly difficult, you'll get your questions answered and enjoy her expert guests. Settle in with Dr. Roberta Shaler now. Leave the drama behind and find peace of mind on today's Relationship Help Show. Here's Dr. Shaler. Welcome to the Relationship Help Show. And today we're talking about hijackles, those people I always talk about, the difficult, disturbing, and toxic people in life, whether they're your partners, your exes, your parents, or someone in the community, or church, or at work. And we're going to be talking about something very different today. We're talking about spirituality and how that plays out when you have a hijackle in your life. And so this is a very different topic for us today here. Haven't spoken about this on the show. I plan to do one show about spirituality every couple of months. So this is a first. And I'm really interested in hearing your feedback. So please make sure that you come onto the Facebook page at um, Relationship Help Show. That's what you put into Facebook, facebook.com slash Relationship Help Show, and tell us what you thought about today's episode and this topic of hijackles, power, and spirituality. It's really important for us to think about some spiritual things because so often we want to grasp the great big concepts and we don't take them down into their smallest parts and really think about them. So one of those things that I want to speak to you today about is the idea of unconditional love. I know, it sounds so fabulous. It sounds so right. It sounds like the most wonderful thing to do. And it is, except when you're with a hijackle. You have to be unconditionally loving to yourself, and you can be unconditionally loving to them at a distance with strong boundaries. So I'm going to talk to you about the four scary ways that unconditional love can be a really dangerous myth in one of our segments today. And then I'm excited to bring you an old friend and colleague of mine. He's not so old, but we've been friends for a long time, Dr. Dennis Merritt-Jones. And you can learn more about him at his website, DennisMerrittJones.com. Uh, two N's in Dennis, two R's and two T's in Merritt. And Jones is just like you'd expect it. Dennis Merritt Jones. He's written many books. Right now we're going to talk about his called Your Redefining Moments, Becoming Who You Were Born to Be. That's exciting. Lots of great topic there. And he's going to talk about why self-inquiry is the best place to start having your most fulfilling life. So that's exciting. And then the second part of my interview with Dr. Dennett Merritt-Jones is spiritual organizations, because many times you'll find yourself in an organization that really seems to have in place wanting power over people, and it will have people in positions of power who are hijackles and are delighted to be granted the right to have power over people. You might have met one or two of those in your life, have you? <laughs> um, if you've been in spiritual organizations of any kind, churches, organizations, whatever uh, your your beliefs are, um, no matter where you go in life, you're going to find hijackles looking for power. And they do that in the spiritual world too. So like I said, this entire show is dedicated to giving you some new thoughts about how things work in spirituality. And the last segment for today is about spirituality, hijackles, and you, what to do. Because I want to draw together the things that you've heard from Dr. Dennis Merritt-Jones, and then the ideas of unconditional love. And then what does that really look like when you're dealing on the ground with a hijackal? So lots of wonderful things for you here. If you're listening live, great. If you're listening to the archive, super. Go to facebook.com slash relationship help show. Put your comments in there. Go and visit my website at forrelationshiphelp.com or my YouTube channel at, of course, youtube.com what slash forrelationshiphelp. Lots to talk about today. Stay tuned. I'm so glad you're here. 
Hello, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Are these stories and questions on today's show sounding familiar to you? Are you ready to say no more to the abuse from toxic people in your life? I'm so glad. You matter and you deserve to have real love, true love in your life. Love from yourself and love from others. Not that demeaning, discounting, and dismissive masquerade that a hijackal pretends is love. I can help you regain yourself, your self-esteem, your self-confidence after a life with a hijackal, whether it was your partner, an ex, a parent, or a child. Let's work together now. For individual sessions or small group coaching, visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join. Talk soon. You may be thinking that unconditional love is going to be the way that you save your relationship. And there are some real pitfalls in thinking that. Because when you are thinking about unconditional love, that's all about you giving and giving and giving and putting up with absolutely everything. And that's not what it's about at all. So I want to share four of what I consider scary reasons why unconditional love is a dangerous myth in some cases. <clears throat> because unconditional love is not what you think it is. Unconditional love, it, it sounds so good, so right, so worth pursuing, so righteous. It sounds like perfection and world peace. In fact, it sounds like a Miss America pageant, but it's a trap. If you buy the myth that it's possible to love unconditionally, it will keep you perpetually feeling inadequate. Can you actually... In real life, within the human condition, can you actually imagine being able to accept another adult without him or her having to meet any conditions or to love them completely irrespective of their behavior? By all means, give unconditional love to babies and young children. But beyond that, what about standards and values and morals and justice and legality and boundaries? Are you ready to let them go too? Because unconditional love dismisses them. So here are very four what I consider very important reasons why unconditional love is not a healthy model for growing up relationships. Yes, it's wonderful when everybody is an adult and emotionally healthy, but there are many cases where it is not a healthy model. So here's number one, unconditional love can be a toxic myth. It insinuates that non-acceptance is a bad thing. That boundaries and issues and feelings, even conflict maybe, is bad because we should accept everything. In fact, more than accept, it demands that we blindly love the person and the behaviors. What enabling nonsense. Relationships have issues. Healthy relationships demand working through those issues in a mature, positive way. Negotiating the appropriate, reasonable conditions for a mutually satisfactory experience of love between partners. You establish known conditions and negotiate new agreements to create safety and trust and to create a non-manipulative, game-free space where you two can grow together and flourish. Number two, unconditional love is like a get-out-of-jail-free card. If someone loved you unconditionally, think about this now, if someone loved you unconditionally, you'd be free to treat them in whatever way you wanted. You could lie, cheat, manipulate, exploit, even abuse, and you'd never be called on it. Now, how can that be loving? Because remember what I said, unconditional love is going to keep you in a state of perpetually being inadequate because you'll constantly be called to give more and to put up with more and it won't be healthy. So like I said, if you love someone unconditionally and they know it and maybe they believe that you believe it's the right thing to do and if you're with a hijackal, they're going to use that 
oh my, they're going to use that. And then they'll come back at you and say, but you believe in unconditional love. Why are you talking to me like that? So we can't allow people to lie, cheat, manipulate, exploit, or abuse us because we somehow believe in unconditional love. How can that be loving? It certainly isn't healthy. In my work with the partners and exes and adult children of these relentlessly difficult, disturbing, and toxic people that I call hijackles, I clearly see the failings and impossibilities of unconditional love. Yes, you can be unconditionally loving at a distance, maybe a very great distance, maybe over a long time. That's for you to do. But to be in the relationship with them, letting them get away with anything, treating you in any way, that is not what we're talking about when we talk about unconditional love. <clears throat> because remember, hijackles want to hijack relationships for their own purposes, and then they want to relentlessly scavenge them for power, status, and control. So you believe in unconditional love, and they want emotional, verbal, and physical advantages, not to mention sexual, and they want to win no matter the cost. So what happens? You lose every time. That's a marriage made in hell. So number three, the term unconditional love has a surprising and out-of-context origin. Just in case you thought the term came from some spiritual tradition, it didn't. Eric Fromm, he was a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and he introduced the idea in 1934, and he wrote about it in his book, The Art of Loving, in 1956. So you can see it's pretty new. <clears throat> and he suggested several kinds of love, the first being a mother's unconditional love for her infant. She has no expectations for it to live up to. She loves it just because it breathes. And in that same book, though, he states that a father's love has to be different. It has to be, believe it or not, somehow deserved. Fromm says that the father sets the standard a child must meet if he or she wants love. So, OMG, that's the origin of the term unconditional love. And I hope you see why you absolutely must question the whole idea now. In Fromm's work, unconditional love was for infants. And yes, by all means, let's have more of that. But generalizing it to all people in all situations, bad idea. Why? Well, it's an unattainable myth. It guarantees that you'll fail. And while it's guaranteeing that you'll fail, it guarantees it'll keep you feeling small, striving, guilty, never good enough. In my book, Kaizen for Couples, I emphasize that mutuality is essential for having a healthy relationship. And in there, I wrote these words, mutuality is for emotional grown-ups. It is based on an interest in each other as a whole, complex person living in the present. When dependence or codependence are consistently present in a relationship, mutuality cannot be. Mutuality, then, is a defining condition for a healthy, mature relationship. Remember, that's from my book, Kaizen for Couples, K-A-I-Z-E-N for Couples. You can get it on Amazon or go to kaizenforcouples.com. So healthy relationships cannot be unconditional because that would call for either continuing masochism or endless self-sacrifice. And who would want to live like that, right? Not you. So number four. Unconditional love undermines justice. <clears throat> there would be no sanctions, no punishments for those who've hurt others. Well, that's crazy, right? If life has purpose and meaning, which most people believe it does, then there can be no such thing as an unconditional experience. We're creatures of perception, and everything has purpose and meaning. We're confronted by conditions that invite and allow us to learn and to grow. And unconditional love wipes all that out. It just dismisses the significance of ourselves and others as unique human beings. And it makes all behaviors okay. And they're not. They're not at any level. So who would want to live in that paradigm with that myth? 
I hope that you can now see why I say that this is a very dangerous myth. Great for babies and children, not great when you're trying to negotiate and have a mutual, reciprocal, equal, and therefore healthy, mature relationship between two adults. If you want to learn more about this, go to forrelationshiphelp.com. Sign up for my newsletter, Tips for Relationships, and let's stay in touch. There's so much to discover. Life as a couple can be exciting and enriching. You both feel supported, known, heard, and appreciated. You know you're safe. Is that what you're experiencing? Does your partner have your back? Can you be vulnerable safely? Do you trust each other fully? Would you say you were emotionally intimate? If not, things can get much better. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, and I work with couples just like you all over the world by video conferencing. If you want a world-class relationship, learn how now. Visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join and schedule a time to work together. Let's talk soon. forrelationshiphelp.com slash join. I'm here with my guest, Dr. Dennis Merritt-Jones, and we're talking here in part two of this interview about spiritual matters, redefining ourselves. We've talked about his book, uh, Your Redefining Moments, How Becoming Who You Are Born to Be. And we were talking about taking time to be with yourself and to actually have some discovery about these things. And I, I'd like to continue that conversation for a moment because people need to get in the way of this, don't they? It's not a one-time thing. It's something no, that you have to do frequently. Practice. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a lifestyle. To, be, to live consciously and proactively and, and with a willingness to challenge your thoughts. That's why emotional awareness is so important because your emotions will tell you what's going on in your mind. If your body will report to your mind what's going on, but you have to be sensitive enough to see it, interpret it, and challenge it. Yes. You know, um, my partner and I wrote a book called Soul Solitude, Taking Time for Our Souls to Catch Up. Mm -hmm. And so frequently, that's not something that we do. You know, in the hustle and bustle of daily life, or just in certain stages of life when your business, you're working in your business or your job and you have children and, you know, so many things are calling your attention, to be able to set time aside to actually be as opposed to do <laughs> is sometimes something that people just say, oh, I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. But why would they? make time what would be the most compelling reason that would cause them to maybe reconsider that dennis because they must arrive at an awareness that they're worthy of it that they're, that they're worth investing that time and energy uh in in healing their own uh wounded self if you will that that has been defined by other people mm -hmm. and what do you think happens to people if they never make this inquiry well they they live from the outside in and the world defines them and they're always going to be a slave to that. That's not a very happy thought for folks that they're always going to be a slave to the expectations of others. So, so to liberate ourselves requires tremendous courage, tremendous courage. It, it, there's no getting around that. It takes courage to do that, but you also can align yourself with people who can be your cheerleaders, people who really know where you're going, why they've been there themselves. Let them, cheer you on let them be part of your support team that that encourages you and holds you accountable for standing in a higher truth about yourself and we all need cheerleaders i love the fact you brought that word up because we need to surround ourselves with people who actually want us to move forward in life they have our best interest in life and, and Roberta, that's one of the biggest problems you know there's an old saying keep your goals from the trolls <laughs> <laughs> Don't share where you want to go with your life with people that you know are going to undermine it and kick sand on it. It's just you have to be more mindful and, and diligent about who you uh, invite to be your support team. But they're out there. Get a mentor. You know, some, I'm sure some of your clients uh, 
look to you as, as being the mentor for that cheerleading aspect of, of their lives, as I do with my mentoring clients. Mm-hmm. And having someone who will lead you in this process is great. Obviously, Dennis is one of those people. And make sure that you go to his website at DennisMerrittJones.com. And Merritt is spelled with two R's and two T's. <laughs> Dennis with two N's. So everything's double that you would expect. <laughs> DennisMerrittJones.com and uh, learn more about his books and learn about his mentoring. So, you know, we've both been involved in spiritual organizations over a long period of time. And sometimes everybody, of course, is growing at different rates, but sometimes people get stuck in those organizations, or sometimes someone joins an organization looking for a sense of power. Have you found that to be true? Oh, absolutely. And it's not just the leadership. Oftentimes, you know, volunteers in churches really need to look at why they're volunteering. You know, is it to be, to gain approval and love of the minister or other people in church, or is it because you're really called to serve in a unique and special way? Too often we volunteer because we think that that's how we're going to get earn love. And that's, that's the wrong motivation to get involved in volunteering. Now, from a, a leadership perspective, no question. A lot of people find their way on to, into levels of leadership, be it whether it's be a minister or, or a board of dr- trustees or, or uh, some other leadership role in the spiritual community. That's where they garner their power. Uh, and I don't... It, 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 that's not to say that that happens all the time, but it does happen often. And so we have to be able to identify others when we're looking to them uh, and giving our power to them because they're in a position of power that we believe we need to have their approval or acceptance or love to be all right. Yes, it's certainly been my experience that I think probably everybody can relate to the person who is takes on a small job in the, in the church and then owns that job in a wonderful way, but then owns it to the point of trying to override everybody else. So they're looking for that moment where they get their say and they get validation for who they are. And sometimes um, they can be pushy and difficult too. I mean, churches are not exempt from that kind of behavior, which which is always a bit of a surprise to me, even after all the years that I've worked in those organizations, is, you know, you hear these messages, you listen, you supposedly read, you gather that there are ways of being that are filled with love and collaboration and openness and (laughs) non-judgment. And then you find yourself in a situation where all those things are just the opposite sometimes, don't you? Yeah, which is why self-inquiry is such a valid practice. If you're looking to become engaged in an organization where you're going to serve, you know, in, in the, the East, there's a word called seva, which is a Sanskrit word. It means selfless service dedicated to God. When you get involved in a church and you, with the desire to serve, be sure that that's your intention, not to garner the approval or the love or appreciation of those around you. And the same could be said for the leaders of the church, too. They need to be clear on, on what, what truth they are speaking from when they extend themselves to their congregations. And I've had several people in my practice, Dennis, which is uh, helping the partners, the exes, and the adult children of these toxic people, um, who have been with people, either their parents or their partner, who have become kind of... Um, taken a leadership role in a church, and then what happens with hijackals is they put on this incredible public face, Mm -hmm. and then at home, they are not that. They are demeaning and degrading and downputting, and and, uh, when you go in the situation then, a couple goes to church, one of the partners has a position of power, and then they try to use that power to further demean their partner. And then that partner can't get anyone to hear that they're being treated poorly. Because, of course, that light, that person who's, who's in that position of power would never treat somebody poorly at home, right? Which is why it's important to, to build your inner strength and let go of the need to have those around you understand or approve of what you're doing. Right. And also, it's very important to be able to take that inner strength and know when it's time to move on into a different situation. Yeah. 
Sometimes I find that people get trapped, um, particularly the people who have been with hijackals, they'll go to a spiritual organization and somehow they find the justification of unconditional love. And so they'll say, oh, well, I, you know, I just have to love this person more. Now, there's an equal number of male and female hijackals, so I'm not using any pronouns. But, you know, if I just love them more, if I'm more patient with them, I'm less demanding, I'm more nurturing, you know, you've got all these things that you can turn yourself into a pretzel, then that person will change. And that other person has absolutely no intention of ever changing. Unconditional love doesn't be, mean being a doormat. No. Unconditional love sometimes calls you to the highest part of loving yourself first, and so much so that you give yourself permission to step back from that relationship. That's hard. But if you love yourself enough, you'll do what's right for you first. Yeah, I like the way you said that, Dennis. And Loving yourself is not an egotistical, narcissistic thing. That's not what we're talking about. We're saying that you have value, that you have needs, you have the right to say what you think, feel, need, and want. You have the right to take up space and draw breath. <laughs> Nobody has the right to tell you that you don't. This is what we're talking about, loving yourself. We're not talking about... Uh, narcissism. We're not talking about uh, self-centeredness. And, and Roberta, if you're coming from that place of, of uh, your authentic self, actualizing that unique being that you were the moment you were born and you're bringing into the world, you'll love yourself enough to, to be that courageous, to, to re reveal that part of who you are to the world because that's part of how you're going to fulfill your purpose. And you'll never fulfill that purpose by kowtowing or allowing others to garner your power and to, to uh, be the troll under the bridge. Yeah. Well, you know, this is, this is powerful conversation for those people who may have got things a little bit twisted and been helped to have things a little bit twisted around unconditional love. You know, I, you can make yourself feel very, very badly if you think that you deserve to be treated badly because you are doing it in the guise of being unconditionally loving. In other words, I'll put up with anything. I'll take whatever you give me because I am going to be this beam of unconditional love. And that just simply is not on, is it? No. No. I think that a lot of times, you know, we in relationships, we tend to demonstrate in our lives those who will create c conditions that will reinforce what we believe to be the truth about ourselves. And if we're unworthy, we're going to draw somebody into our lives who's going to treat us that way. So as within, so without, you know, we need to kind of up our game with who we, who we know ourselves to be. And you might find yourself drawing a different kind of person in, into your life who will resonate and respect with reverence that person. Well, you said a mouthful there when you said that, you know, we'll attract because, you know, my books are back there. You've written many books. I've written many books. The book, the yellow book back there is called What You Pay Attention to Expands. Yeah. So where you are in your mind, what you're focused on, what your intentions are, where you're going is so important. And that's what I love about your new book, your redefining moments, um, because you, you really sounds like it's a workbook. It can take someone to really do some self-inquiry and get this understanding of themselves, which is so very important. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a journey of shifting your consciousness, your belief system. You don't change a belief system. Uh, if you're 40 or 50 years old, you don't change your, your, the, the established belief system you're living in in a week or a two-week class. It's a process <laughs> of daily continuing to feed yourself new thoughts and ideas that will create a different type of belief system for yourself. And that, that takes work, but it's possible to do. Consciousness is everything. That's what we need to be working at as a level of consciousness to change our beliefs about what is in the world. Because as I said, as within, so without. Yes. And I remember early on when you wrote the art of being, you know, such an important beginning place. So I really want to thank you. I think we've got lots of great ideas for another conversation in the new year, Dennis, and I hope you'll join us. It's so important to look at ourselves as whole people and the spiritual aspect of ourselves has to be looked at. 
uh, whether you define that as simply your connection to nature and the larger world or you define it as your your uh, allegiance to a particular um, belief system but it's very important to consider so thank you so much for being with us and um, good work. oh thank you thank you um, <clears throat> I love it when this alarm goes off. <laughs> it just will not stop and it just keeps making a horrible noise. Um, but let's just ignore that for a minute. And um, I want to tell people again, go to DennisMerrittJones.com and learn more about Dennis and his fabulous work and find him and go to hear him speak or have him be your mentor. Thanks so much for being with us, Dennis. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Hi, this is Dr. Roberta Shaler. Handling hijackles is exhausting. It's never ending. An endless cycle of crazy making, alienation, and constant drama. And cycles are difficult to step out of. I know because I've been there too. And that's why I reach out to you to offer the insight, skills, and strategies you need to heal. My small group programs, Handling Hijackles and Hijackle Recovery and Rediscovery, will shortcut your journey to healing, to save your sanity, and to stopping the crazy making. Visit forrelationshiphelp.com slash join now and let's talk soon. Hello and welcome to this great discussion that we're going to have with my guest, Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones a very well-known author. He even writes for HuffPo. And you can really learn a lot from him by reading some of the books that he's written, like The Art of Being or The Art of Uncertainty, or his new book, Your Redefining Moments. Um, that's very, very important. We're going to talk to him about these this book. And um, he just has so much to say because he has walked in so many arenas and today particularly we're going to talk about spiritual matters because that's one of the things that uh, Dennis brings to this he has a lot of experience in that realm as I do and I wanted to talk with him about some really important things that you might be surprised by so in part one we're going to talk about Dennis's work and the fact that we really need to know who we are on this planet and why we're here so welcome to the program Dennis thank you my friends good to see you it's great to see you too. We've done some TV together. We've had some fun together and uh, I'm delighted that you're here and I love the new book that you have out, The uh, Redefining Moments, Becoming Who You're Meant to Be. Is that the subtitle? The su subtitle is Becoming Who You Were Born to Be. Born to Be. So you think that there is some predestiny involved to you? I don't. I don't know if I call it predestiny, but there's we're each encoded with with a gift to to bring to the planet that, that is so unique that it can't be given to the world through anybody but us. Hmm, that's a nice idea. So that we're each unique and we have a purpose, and that it's our mission to fulfill. Would you say that's true? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so we're uniquely imprinted with uh, this uh, desire to be expressed, fully expressed. To and express means to push out, to take this inner knowing of who we are and bring it out to the world in so many different ways to do it. And that's the journey is discovering how to bring the gift of yourself to the world in a way that fulfills you and makes the planet a better place. I love that, but what happens if you don't do it? Uh, you, you have no choice but to express yourself. And unfortunately, if you don't choose to express that energy in a, a positive, affirmative way, it'll find a way to express in you and through you in ways that are productive, but not necessarily, not necessarily in a healthy or beneficial manner. So I would guess that you suggest that you sit quietly and figure this all out. It's a good place to start. <laughs> well, so many people don't, do they, Dennis? I mean, really, for... There's a whole world view out there that says, be more, do more, have more, run, you know? Yeah. And, and so people don't sit quietly. They don't 
give themselves that le luxury and that leisure to get in touch with themselves or get in touch with spiritual matters or to ask the important questions. They're, they're just driven. I think that um, uh, we, we each, uh, when, we, when we're born, we know fully who we came here to be. But as we grow, we get spiritually unconscious. We go comatose, you know, we have spiritual amnesia. We begin to forget that unique imprint of, of the divine that we were set here to be. And the older we get, the more we forget about who we were and who we were born to be. And we get covered with these labels, starting with our gender and our name and our social security number. And, you know, it goes on and on and on with the labels that we get covered with. And by the time we get into adulthood, we've totally forgotten the authentic being that we were when we were born and were created to be. And so the book, uh, Your Redefining Moments, is, is to guide the reader back to that, that moment in time where they were originally creatively created as a sacred being and to learn how to bring that authentic self into their daily lives. And that's mm -hmm. a, it's, it's, a, it's a growth process and it doesn't happen overnight, but it doesn't happen at all if you don't initiate a conscious intention to do so. Well, that whole idea of conscious intention is huge. You know, I talk about it so frequently because you think about Lynn McTaggart and the intention um, experiment. And, and, and so let's just talk about intention for a moment. If we're just going willy-nilly being driven through life, you know, I've got to go here, I've got to go there, this is success, I'm only successful when, I'm trying to live up to the expectations of others, I'm engaged in the drama of life. It is really difficult to withdraw and find out what your intention is, even for the next hour, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's why I, I teach mindfulness in all of my books and all of my, my, my mentoring I work diligently to bring people into a practice of mindfulness, which is where that, you, you know what it is, that, that moment when we bring our minds back into our bodies, because our minds are always out in front of us or behind us, you know, uh, but our bodies, you notice, are always present tense. And, and so the, the, the practice is to bring our mind back into the awareness of being one in the presence in the moment, because that's our point of power. And if we can be mindful enough to observe what's going on around us in the moment, then we can respond to it rather than react to it. And that really ties into the whole idea of what the Relationship Help Show is all about, because we're about helping people with difficult situations, with the difficult, disturbing, toxic people in life. And if you don't understand exactly what you just said that where am i right now what's really going on and be able to step out of denial step back and actually have a look and say this is this is actually what's going on here i'm seeing patterns i'm seeing cycles i'm seeing traits and i'm seeing them repeatedly and frequently and it affects me badly if we don't do that we will allow ourselves to lose our life in a sense. Yeah, we, we're, we're from, the, from the day we're born, as I said, we begin to get, become unconscious and we forget who we really are. We take on the identities of, that people want us to have, whether it's our parents or our ministers or our teachers, you know, the, the TV gives us a great identity. You know, buy this deodorant, this jewelry, drive that car, and then you'll be a whole person. And uh, we have to transcend that whole mindset and, and take the journey back to uh, that place that uh, is so personal, it's intensely personal, because nobody can go there with us. It's, the, it's at the center of our being and, and getting back in touch with that sacred aspect of us that is unique and authentic, unlike any other human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is particularly pertinent to the partner's or the exes or the adult children or co-workers of these difficult people because we tend to be externally referenced we tend to let those people tell us who we are and they tell us how we'll be and the this discussion that we're having and why I was so excited to have you on the program a to bring the spiritual aspect but to talk about this very thing that at any moment you can change this yep. you can say I need to be more intentional in my life. I need to really step back and have a look at what's really going on. So you know, what, what's the good starting point, Dennis? 
it, the, the starting point is you have to be willing to challenge authority. You have to be willing to challenge those who have given an identity to you and to take a step back from that, from, from that process and begin to uh, find your part. As you said, we, we, we tend to look towards external uh, identifications to, to garner our power. External power is, is we gain it through a beautiful body or a, a strong body or, or a lot of money in the bank or all these, these things that are on the periphery of who we really are. But it's too many of us are defined by those things. And, and oftentimes we give our power to other people, especially those in places of authority, because we want their love. We want to be approved of. We want to be accepted. And we think by, by giving way to allowing them to define who we are, at least we're going to be loved, which is a horrible way to sacrifice our, the truth of our being. That is so important. And it's so important if you happen to be with a person who's not treating you well, because you get into a pattern of running after that approval. And the other thing that happens is when you're dealing with a hijackal, which is my term for these difficult people, is that in the beginning they presented differently. They presented as this wonderful human being who almost was a mind reader. They could get into your innermost thoughts and feelings, give you exactly what you wanted. You felt known and seen and acknowledged and heard. And you were just completely delighted that you'd found this person. And so that memory stays there and you become hooked on hope that that's going to return. And so you begin to then be running after that original dream while not acknowledging what's actually happening to you. And so becoming mindful of what's happening becomes very, very important. And it's also important to remember that in spiritual matters, we also will often belong to a group where there will be some of this, also, this behavior going on. We're going to talk more about that in the second half, but let's just stick with what can a person do first? If they're just hearing this for the first time and they're saying, I need to get intentional about my life. I need to just think, maybe I'm here for a purpose. Maybe I need to sit down and figure this out. How do they go about it? Self-inquiry is a huge practice. To, to be able to be still and know, to go within and, and turn off the external world and begin to have a dialogue with your, your deeper self or higher self uh, and allow information from that place within you to reveal itself. And as you do that, you'll begin to sense your internal authentic power rising, which disconnects you from needing to access that power from without or around you. So meditation uh, reading the right books, by the way, the, the redefining moments, becoming who you were born to be, was written for that purpose to guide people back to and to give them practices. At the end of each chapter, there's mindfulness practices and points to ponder that remind them it, from that chapter they read how to practice those ideas in their lives that day. So it's about it's about training your mind not only to think differently but to be the observer of your thoughts. And when those thoughts come up or the, that represent our beliefs, to challenge those thoughts rather than give, give way to them or allow them to have their way. And, and that's the challenging part is to challenge the thoughts and beliefs that, that disturb us because we're afraid that by challenging those thoughts and beliefs, uh, we may be called out and realize that we have work to do that we're really not willing to do. <laughs> oh, I think you hit the nail on the head right there with the work to do that we're not willing to work. My guest today is Dr. Dennis Merritt Jones. You can learn more about him at DennisMerrittJones.com. And Merritt has two R's and two T's. So remember that. And uh, we're going to be back in part two to talk about the spiritual aspect of being in community and how these things play out then. So stay tuned for part two. No matter what's happening right now, life can get better. If you have a good relationship, it can become great. If your relationship is in trouble, we can find a solution. The good news is that it's in your hands to start. 
The not so good news is that it takes time, new insights and skills, and a whole bunch of willingness. But who would settle for less? Not you, right? Good. You want to feel seen, heard, known, accepted, and appreciated. You want honesty, safety, trust, respect, and reliability too. Read my book Kaizen for Couples, available for download at couplesbook.com. Start there, and let's talk soon. Spirituality, toxic people, and you. What are you supposed to do? It all gets really confusing. So I just want to give you a few ideas, some things to think about before you go down the rabbit hole of thinking that you're supposed to be this unconditionally loving person accepting all the bad behavior that's coming your way. Because you've likely been very challenged by the idea of how to put your spiritual beliefs into practice when you're faced with a difficult, disturbing, or toxic person in your life. Are you supposed to love them no matter what? Can you express and maintain strong boundaries? What if you belong to a spiritual organization that has rules and expectations that you behave in a certain way? And those difficult, disturbing, and toxic people I call hijackles have all the members believing that they are the salt of the earth. You know, hijackles will show you one face at home, the not-so-nice face, and then they'll put on the pretty public face, and they'll be night and day. So these are big issues when you're following a spiritual path. I know. I walk with so many people in this dilemma. So <clears throat> I've written and spoken about the four ways unconditional love is a dangerous myth. And on the Relationship Help Show, I did a segment on that very thing. You'll find it in episode 23. And it's alone as a segment on my iTunes channel for Relationship Help. So go over there. There's so much for you. So I know to some that the title alone is heresy. That what about unconditional love? Isn't it all or nothing? But imagine the horrible pull, and you may be experiencing it, between wanting to believe that a good person loves unconditionally and then being with a hijackal. That hijackal wants you to love him or her unconditionally, but they have no willingness or interest or even the ability to love you back. I believe that real love flows naturally in two directions. There it is. There's a problem. When love is not flowing naturally in both directions, you know there's an issue. But will you see it? Or will you think that if only you work harder at being more loving, more compassionate, more patient, more kind, less demanding, have fewer expectations or stay out of their way, then everything will be fine? No, it won't be fine. Because love is not flowing naturally in two directions. Hijackles take, take, take. They only give when they have to and if it's going to get them what they want in the moment. Be unconditionally loving when there is mutuality. Otherwise, see the forest for the trees. A hijackal doesn't have love to give you. A hijackal loves what you have to give him or her. Hijackals have uses for you, not love to give you. So, spirituality, hijackals, and you, how do you put these things together? So, here's a few ideas for you. Martin Buber, an Austrian-born Jewish philosopher, wrote a really classic book in 1923. Didn't make it into English till 1934, but it was called I and Thou. And one of the major themes of the book is that human life finds its meaningfulness in relationships. So in Martin Buber's view, all of our relationships bring us ultimately into relationships with God. And in the book, he wrote, get this now, indelibly write it in your head. When two people relate to each other authentically and humanly, God is the electricity that surges between them. Key words, authentically and humanly. That's an equal, reciprocal, and mutual relationship with each other. Not a, uh, you do what I want, and I'll ignore your needs, wants, and feelings completely. 
you can see why it's important to really dig into what it means to understand your spiritual beliefs and recognize that there are many levels that need to be considered. Of course, you be a person who is aligned with your values. That's your job. That's your life. That's you expressing your beliefs and your values and your uh, ideas about life. That's you fully expressing. That's not you doing backflips when someone tells you to and always feeling not good enough. Those two things just don't go together at all. There are spiritual traditions that are based, based on you feeling worthless or at least unworthy. Question those. Those will attract hijackals into positions of power. Can't you just imagine how delighted a hijackal would be to be able to quote scripture to make him or her right and of course make you wrong? I've had clients, you know, I work with the partners, the exes and adult children of these difficult, disturbing and toxic people I call hijackals. I've had clients whose partners have taken leadership roles in churches with very defined, if not rigid, codes of conduct. Those hijackals love, love, love the superiority they gain by making other people feel small, wrong, and unworthy. Worse, in those organizations, the hijackal puts on an amazing show of being the salt of the earth, of being the most righteous of all. And yet at home, their behaviors are like beasts from somewhere far away from heaven. So when the partner of one of these righteous appearing hijackals tries to tell someone in the church how the hijackal behaves at home, guess what? The partner is met with ridicule and shame because the way the hijackal shows up at church and how she or he shows up at home is 180 degrees apart. So the continuously wounded partner gets wounded again at the very place they hope to find solace. I define spirituality simply the experience of a positive and transformative connection. Our spiritual life transforms us and changes us. We will think and feel and behave differently as a result of that transformation. It gets confusing, doesn't it? I've been transformed and the partner pretends to speak the right words while behaving very differently at home. Because you've been transformed, you might think, at least initially, that you should become accepting of the bad behavior at home. No, wrong, don't do that. What is true, though, is that by doing your own work and following your own spiritual path, you are on the path to a positive transformational connection with yourself. It doesn't necessarily follow that that will change your relationships with others. It especially doesn't follow that it will help with the hijackal. So yes, it's confusing, and I invite you to really think this through. Here's a few quick things that hijackals will continue to do at home while putting on a false face at church. They will put you down, saying that you don't practice what you preach at every moment. And remember, hijackals never look in the mirror, so the fact that he or she never practices what they preach at home will never be of any interest to them. It's all about winning over you and making you wrong. They will bully you, laugh at you, and put you down for not, quote unquote, getting it. Wow, that wouldn't be judgment, would it? Of course it is, but to a hijackal, that street only goes one way. Hijackals are never wrong. Well, what can I say about that, except that it is an absolute in their eyes that they are never wrong. They cannot and will not handle any criticism. Strange, however, that they feel free to criticize you constantly. And they tell you that you are misguided, mistaken, and stupid to manipulate you into letting them tell you what to do. So big note here, you can never, ever please a hijackal for more than a moment. So think about that. So here you have some thoughts about how to think about life with a hijackal when you're following your own spiritual paths and some clear patterns that hijackals will use to belittle you if you are following the same path supposedly together. Think about these things. It's so important to your well-being and safety. Be sure also to come and visit at forrelationshiphelp.com and hijackals.com. Get your free copy of an ebook, How to Spot a Hijackal, in case you're wondering if you're with one. Talk soon. 
There you have it. If you want more, you can work with Dr. Shayla directly. She's eager to help you resolve your relationship issues. Have a question? Call in early to next week's show to talk with Dr. Shayla on air. Get her expert insights and advice by subscribing to her blog, newsletter, and YouTube channel. We're here for you. Don't be a stranger. Join us again next week. And in the meantime, visit forrelationshiphelp.com.